two weeks ago, we started this mini series with an input of Johanna Jacobi on the science perspective on agroecology. Of- Laura, in addition to her job at Vision Landwirtschaft, is also a member of the Grüne Partei Luzern and um, Kantonsrätin um, in, in Luzern. As I said, she studied. She, she, as I said, she studied agricultural sciences at ETH and did um, research projects in the Ivory Coast on yams, uh, the cultivation of yams, both in her bachelor and master thesis. So she has also some working experiences abroad, and then acquired experience in sustainable agriculture also during her work at BioSwiss, the import department of BioSwiss. And now, since two years, she is part of a larger think tank community to support the transformation of Swiss agriculture. Laura, it's a great pleasure to have you. And um, thank you for finding the time to join us this evening. Before I hand over to Laura for a 30 minutes introduction on the topic and her policy perspective, I briefly want to uh, bring us all at the same table. So the objectives of this lecture series are to offer different perspectives into the field of agroecology, provide a comprehensive exploration of benefits and the potential, but also maybe some obstacles around agroecology through addressing the challenges and constraints which are within this dynamic field. And I guess also the policy perspective on it brings here important uh, findings into the discussion. It's in line, or it's kind of a part of three series. As I said, Johanna's input on the scientific perspective two weeks ago, and we will conclude this series with an input of Emil Frison next week on agroecology as a tool for food systems transformation. Maybe quick also, because this lecture series is part of a, a lecture at ETH with uh, bachelor students of ETH. And we use here the 13 principles of agroecology as kind of the conceptual background to this course. And they show very much the beauty of agroecology as a concept that it's not only uh, limited to farm level um, practices or um, measurements at of, of, of the farm level, but it encompasses furthermore the entire agri ecosystem using landscape approach, but even further an entire food system perspectives where the question of how are producers and consumers connected, what are the social values of food systems, how can these systems be developed into states of a higher degree of fairness? And how can all the different um, food system actors participate in this transformation? So we have a, a very holistic approach, which goes beyond kind of incremental changes, where we talk about the increase of efficiency of the use of inputs or the reduction of the use of costly and, and scarce environmental um, um, damaging inputs. We talk about uh, also the potential of substitution of conventional inputs with um, more biological inputs or practices within the alternatives offered by agroecology. That's still kind of the incremental part of the story. And when we go more into um, principles which address food systems, we ask ourselves how agroecology can redesign agroecosystems and, as I mentioned earlier, reconnect consumers and producers through the development of alternative food networks and, as a result of all these different uh, levels, to build a new global food systems based on participation, localness, fairness, and justice. So it's very important to remember that there are various levels when we talk about agroecology, and it's also important to address at which level 
we are discussing when we are talking about agroecology in a detailed form or when we address certain selected principles of agroecology. It's always important to have this broader, this holistic perspective on the concept and then also on concrete examples, bringing them back into this more conceptual level of agroecology. I said it's now uh, the second term and we are looking forward to um, the third input next week. If you are wondering what um, Johanna was talking about, you can find on our website the slides of her last, um, her intervention last uh, two weeks ago. And if you are interested in the work of the World Food System Center in general, and you uh, by occasion or uh, intentionally want to come to Zurich, then probably November 2nd is a good day to join us for our food day, an annual symposium of the World Food System Center, where we share research across the entire food systems, not only on agroecology, but on very different elements, which all together build different puzzle pieces in our attempt to provide or to support a food system transformation. So that will be a very warm invitation for you to join us on November 2nd. You can find the details on that symposium on our website as well. After this um, advertisement, it's now really time to hand over to Laura. Laura, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today, virtually at our table and the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us, Laura. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction. I'm also very happy and I thank for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure and honor for me. And I want to say first that I had always very high expect expectations on lectures when I was a student. Now when I have to do it my own, I see it's not so easy. And I, it's, I, it's my second, I did one at Setawe. So I'm very also, also very happy if students give me um, feedback at the end on my lecture so that I can improve things. And I hope I will explain everything very well. I have to say also that on my time at ETR, I didn't have anything, I didn't have any lecture about politics or something. And um, now for me, working at Wiesn Landwirtschaft is very nice because I have my science background. Then I worked a lot in the practice in Switzerland, but also in Europe. And um, now I am also part of the um, politics system. So it gives me very, um, it's it's very great for me to do this. And um, that's why um, I uh, will try also to give you a bit, sometimes politics is very, and also, um, and especially agricultural politics is really complex. And, it's, and sometimes also young people, they fear, to um, go deeper into this um, because of the complexity, because but I would say it's very interesting and I would encourage you to um, go very uh, to to go into this topic and also um, yes try to have your own opinion on these really important questions. Um, I will try to explain uh, what from my perspective, agroecology has a ro uh, which role agroecology has for um, the transformation of our food systems. I will try to show this on two specific examples of projects of our organization, and then um, try to show also with what are the challenges and what is the role of science, policy, or practice um, to overcome these challenges. But first, I would like to jump in um, with an example, um, a very actual example. I don't know if you um, follow the Swiss politics um, about agriculture, but we have we have a new policy. This three and a half um, percent of biodiversity areas have to be newly on arable land, implemented on arable land. And as you all know, we are uh, in the middle of a big biodiversity crisis. Also in Switzerland, we have um, a Swiss agriculture with a high input on the ecosystems. And so the role of agriculture is very important. Agriculture would also benefit about, uh, from a, a stable and good um, 
maintained biodiversity. Um, so that's why um, ad the administration and federal council had this idea to um, uh, of this policy. And this policy is based on a very good established scientific base, of course. Um, I would not challenge that. But the policy were, was elaborated from my perspective, uh, completely without collaboration of um, producers and adopters. And now we are on a point that even organic producers um, with general have a high level of biodiversity on their farms, they refuse this policy. So we have on one hand organic, organic farmers and also very intensive farmers, which refuses the same policy with different arguments, but which leads to a, um, um, that this policy will probably be delayed or even completely changed or canceled. And I mean, this is really frustrating. Um, we have this huge topic of biodiversity, which we should address, and our political system is not able to do it. And we are losing really important time in fighting this biodiversity crisis. And from my perspective, um, what was missing is that we have this um we have seen this uh, before the, the principles um have been shown now we see that biodiversity is one of the important uh, principle but it's not enough to take biodiversity and um, write a nice a policy which is scientific based um we have to achieve this co-creation of knowledge um and participation and fairness and also see that we if we do a policy for farmers um, there should be probably also policy for consumers or for consumption or for the trading part in the value chain. And we have here really a lack uh, or a problem in Switzerland because we have a, a policy focused on agriculture and on farmers perspective. Um, if we want to um, achieve the goal to stop uh, this biodiversity crisis or to enhance biodiversity in our um, food system, for sure the adopters have firstly understand why biodiversity is key for a functioning agroecosystem. And um, uh, if they don't understand it, they will deny policies or not accept policies. And um, we have a certain, um, the principle of connectivity is in a way already adapted because um, producers already receive subsidies, but um, this alone will not help to um, make that these policies are really implemented. implemented. Um, so after this example, I would like to um, be quickly on the role of agroecology in food transformation. Um, of course, we have this uh, global problem that our food systems are not sustainable right now. We have um, a huge impact on our environment, on our health, and also social issues out of from, from this food system. And we know um, from there are really a lot of publications showing that agroecology is a powerful strategy, that agroecology can reduce the trade-offs between productivity and sustainability, and also can really emphasize the food actor's empowerment. And I think this is really an important point. So from a policy perspective, agroecology is key, especially for actors' empowerment through the holistic policy approach and addressing also the whole agriculture issues in their complexity. We have also very recent analysis regarding, regarding agroecology agroecology level of Swiss food system by Bernhard Lehmann. Um, he was uh, my professor at ETIA. And um, you can go deeper into this, um, into this uh, publication, but it's for sure that um, we have some, on some point achieved a lot for agroecology in Switzerland, but we have also a lot of um, challenges. And the challenge is really to find a solution to make policies for the whole value chain. Um, if you look in a broader way, um, we know that we, if you're talking about uh, food uh, system transformation, for me, it's important sometimes when, when you're into 
too much into the scientific perspective. Uh, it's like you would do it on a white paper or on a green field, but we start with the system we already have. And this of course is well valid for Switzerland, but also for other countries. And um, we have really huge market failures in particular regarding environmental impacts or animal welfare or social costs. And only there where we have supporting policies we see also in, in literature that we can achieve the goals. In European Union, they have now several strategies, including agroecology. Uh, I linked them here. It's interesting to see what they are planning to do. In Switzerland, we have a special situation that we have now the Federal Council, uh, which said clearly that for 2050, um, they want to achieve certain goals um, and also they put a lot of importance to ag agroecology and it's mentioned, but um, not really all principles are integrated and um, there are some principles which are not clearly said or described how they could be addressed. And we are really now at this step, at this agro agriculture policy 2030, which is very important. Um, to go deeper into these levels of <laughs> agroecology. And the Federal Office of Agriculture is now working on it. And this is now the political part for this, that of course you can do a very good um, agriculture policy. You can even do it with participation, co-creation of knowledge and integrate everything and everybody. But then the Federal Council has to accept and also the national part. Parliament has to accept it, and the two the two um, chambers of the national parliament, and this is really difficult to um, to have all these um, um, these actors at the end that you can go really on one direction, and at the end also after you have to implementation has to work of all these policies because not everything which is uh, decided by our parliament then it's our, it's also um, well, it's also easy to implement then for the stakeholders. So this is really the questions, how can we bring these principles of agroecology now in this policy? This is not clear yet. I'm also in this um, group, which will uh, be integrated by the federal office to work these things out. And I'm really curious how we are going to manage it. So that's why we. I go now from this, this was a bit, um, wider perspective on this, uh, where we are now also in Switzerland at this topic. But um, in our work at Vision Landwirtschaft, we try to um, find solutions on concrete projects. And we are doing these projects always in a co-creative processes. We try to integrate practice, science, and politics all um, in every project we do. We want to achieve a food system which protects climate resources and promotes biodiversity and to work out framework conditions which lead to sustainable production and consumption schemes. Um, we are working together with other organizations uh, very intensively in this Agrar Alliance. I don't know if you know this, it, there are very a lot of organizations working together and we are really trying to um, to address the, the, these, these topics, these policies, and giving solutions. And um, one the first project I want to present you is a pilot project Vision Landwirtschaft does in collaboration with E4S, with Dominique Bajol and Laurence Chancro. And we choose the bread. We choose the bread because uh, Swiss people likes bread and nobody gets angry if you discuss about bread. It's better than meat. It's better than talking about meat. And we try to do, um, I don't know if you uh, learned something about the true cost accounting for food. Um, it's, it's the, the methodology is quite well described in lit literature, um, but so far we don't have um, really applied practice or successful policies or example in Switzerland that shows how you can include these true costs and also how these true costs can be calculated in a way that it will also be accepted by the stakeholders. And um, that's, oh, sorry, that's why we start with the bread 
um, as a first um, case study, we uh, compared conventional, organic, and um, pesticide-free breads, and we look at the whole value chain. We um, Our goals are to record and describe the full costs, economic, environmental, and social, including also health costs, um, of the bread value chain from farm to fork. And then we will work also a lot on communication. Um, we have a communication concept for the public, but also for the relevant stakeholders in the food system, uh, which is very important then for the policy making. So we don't do first the scientific work and we then go to the stakeholders, but we do um, a system where we integrate them. I will show it later. Just briefly, um, for everybody, what is when I'm talking about true costs of food, um, we are pretty sure that this could be a lever to transform the Swiss system because it helps in a, when I explain it on a very simple way. If um, I go um, and buy an organic bread, I pay a higher price, but at the end, um, I my um, um, uh, I'm looking for the word. Um, um, the impact on environment is probably smaller than if I buy a conventional bread and also the impact on my health probably is smaller, but I pay a higher price. So the incentive goes, goes on the wrong direction from a point of view of consumption. And in some cases, also the producers have the wrong incentives. And in this project, we calculate the natural capital, human capital, and social capital. We can see all these factors. Um, E4S is really working also um, with different partners to really have a good, um, um, also uh, for the natural capital, we uh, work with life cycle assessment and um, in the, with the, for the health data that will go deeper with, um, yeah, I probably cannot say too much, but it, um, when we when we have, when we'll have the results presented, I could explain it better, but we really try to go very deep in, this, in these calculations and then to see, um, oh, no, I thought this would be, yeah, this is the, the, the thing should have come first. Um, but the concept is that we do a participation and co-creation with the stakeholders. So we do the calculations and the scientific approach of this methodology. And then we go in deep in discussions with the stakeholders before there is any publication. And then we can uh, collect, we have already done this now um, with some stakeholders. And it's really interesting to do these discussions because um, it's important to see what questions they have. And also sometimes, um, assumptions we do are not correct for the Swiss system and we have to go more into the details to um, uh, have them calculations were really showing um, the, the costs how they are in Switzerland they're probably very different than in other countries and so we do this um, with this this game um, and we, we, we go back into the calculations and then we go back into deep in discussions, but also in presenting to the public because we want to take also the public in this process because we will not, this true cost um, topic, we will not do it like in, in some months or in, in, a, in some, well, I hope in some years, but we have also um, the consumers, the public, media, everyone to start to understand this um, uh, this concept, not only from a theoretical um, perspective, but also on, on examples, so on, like this case study, so they can understand um, how they, they, every actor then can understand what he can profit from this system. So this is really what we try to do is to integrate these principles and um, especially the, the principle of fairness um, you can address with them um, equal profit scheme, where then at the end, really the farmers, they can gain um, what they um, what they had as costs to do the production. But probably at the end, their product will not be um, more expensive. For example, if they do biodiversity 
um, measures on their farm. They had more work to do, but at the end, um, it should not be that their product is much more expensive than from a farmer who has less um, biodiversity measures on his farm. So I'm really, um, we don't have the results now, so um, I cannot say more, um, but I think by the end of the year, we, we could present the first results out of this case study, and then I hope we will continue with more case studies. And we have very good feedback now from the stakeholders. They like it, and they are very interested to work with us. The second example is a very different topic, but um, also very interesting. Um, we started this year um, in January a, a, a longer project uh, about women in agriculture and the topic of gender equality. And it's a transdisciplinary project with um, Havel, with Professor Sandra Konzen and Anna Kröcklin. And um, I don't know <laughs> whether you learned something about this at ETIA these days. It was also a new topic for me. I knew it only from, I'm an agronomist, I'm not a um, uh, social scientist. Um, and it's really interesting also in looking what is happening outside of Switzerland, but also looking what is happening in Switzerland. And uh, we have in Switzerland a huge part of um, for, uh, farms are um, family farms and led by families. And for example, in the UN report, it's written that it's very good for agri-food system, for sustainable agri-food system. But we see in Switzerland that there are also some drawbacks related to gender inequalities out of these family, family farming systems. We have also in Switzerland specific laws um, like the um, rural land law, for example, or other la laws that are very old, uh, 50 years old or 70 year years old, and they still, um, it's interesting to look at it, what happened really on the Swiss farms. And one, it's like one data we have that only Swiss person of Swiss farms are led by women. Um, even though the proportion of women who are complete who complete the qualification as operations managers is it's we don't know the exact number number because the data is not available in Switzerland, but it's higher. It's much it must be much higher than the six percent and it's increasing, but the part of women who are leading the Swiss farms it's stable and it's not increasing or not in this way. And that's why we started the project because we have um we um, see that we have in Switzerland, we have also from the part of the education, we have um, different edu uh, ways you can um, then work in agriculture. You can work as a farmer's wife, as an boyerin, or as a farmer, or as a practitioner, as operation manager, there are different terms. Also women reclaim for themselves in Swiss agriculture systems. But um, the project, of course, is not about terms, but it's about how it really works on the farms. And um, now this year, we started with analysis of laws and framework conditions, and also with data analysis, um, data from the Federal Office of Agriculture. We could reanalyze and check some important questions. And we are doing now interviews um, next month um, Quantity, uh, qualitative interviews with some questions out of this data analysis and also out of this uh, analysis of the lows. And um, what is what is what I would really focus today or in this lecture is the living labs we are doing. Um, with these living labs, we want to uh, we will start this next year, and we will want to find out which is the economy economic contribution of the women on their farm and what is their position in the system. We will in, invest in this project also a lot in public relations with the findings of the project. And um, the goals, yes, of course, to get more uh, insights to, uh, into economic contribution. 
I must also say we don't. It's it's a bit shocking. If uh, when I started with this topic, I realized we don't have any data or not enough data. We don't have enough um, also scientific projects on this topic in Switzerland, and um, we then with the findings we want to develop and implement measures to network and straighten women practitioners and then disseminate the knowledge um, through public relations and partner organization, which we are, we are going to work with. And to focus on the living labs, as I said, um, this is really, I think that also the agroecology, the strong agroecology part, um, we will do with 25 women in the German speaking part and with 25 women in the French speaking part. And in this method of the living labs, we work very close together with these women. And so, and they are also um, paid for the work they're going to do in this research project. So they're uh, part of the research. And um, this is, this is a method to develop user-centered knowledge and also to enable innovation. And I'm really, really looking forward. Um, I've never been part of such living labs because I'm a, yes, I'm a, an agronomist and I didn't know a, a lot about these things, but uh, um, that's why I'm working with this Professor Sandra Konzen, which is an, ex an expert. And um, I'm, re I'm sure we are going to find out interesting, interesting results and interesting knowledge. And so this is really the key part because um, it's not like we are doing a project that said, oh, we have to enhance this um, this proportion of women leading uh, the operations in the farms in Switzerland. Um, this is not the goal. We want really to find out um, how they are working on the farms and um, how is the relation of their um, part uh, which they contribute to the economy um, of the farm, but also their position and how how does how is also their education um, important for this? The way they they choose, um, and yes, uh, we will. I'm sure we will find out interesting things with this project. Um, yes, so these are the two um, examples. These are very positive for or for myself. It's very positive to can to work in these projects. But then when we go like back on a on a, another level, um, of course the challenges to really um, achieve the the food system transformation. Yeah, I don't. We are not going to change it with some projects. Um, our as I said before, we have these marked failures. We really don't have the right incentives, um, not in the production level, but also not in the consumption level. And from the actual system, I would say producers are not benefiting or only some, and the consumers are also not benefiting and also our environmental uh, environment and our um for the agriculture, our soils, our um, climate, biodiversity, everything is not is is not profiting from the system we have now, and politics takes not enough responsibility to take to define clear rules for the players in this food system because only if we have these clear rules, we can go all in the same direction and for getting a transformation, um, a clear goal is needed. Okay, we have this now for. 2050 but this seems to be quite far away we have to have goals in the more um in a more closer perspective and uh, there is for sure also international pressure this it's increasing and um it's for sure the, also increasing on the companies um so the companies has also a and other um, pressure to develop themselves, not only the part of the politics, but for the whole society, um, the whole society would benefit the most if politics would take their responsibility and play and defining clear rules for this transformation. We are really, we have uh, in Switzerland, but also in the European Union, we are missing policies on consumption 
and um, on the whole value chain. And this is really, um, this is a big issue for the pol policies because um, it's like you have to create a new area of policies. Um, we have this agriculture policy, which is clear what it is. It's old and it's developed. So everybody knows a bit in which direction it can go, but to create new policies, like also um, incentive taxes or others um, policies, which addresses consumption. This is new for our society. And that's why it's also a big challenge. And um, we have also the topic of cross-border trade relations, um, which can contribute a lot for the sustainable development of our agriculture system in Switzerland and the food sector, but also for the part um, what we um, import. And um, I'm not sure, this is my personal perspective, what, for example, this cross-border trade relations of course, it has to do with the ag agroecology um, uh, principle, but it's very difficult to address them in this way. I mean, these are really, um, yes, this is really then the part of the responsibility of the politic to take um, measures there. And we have huge financial interests of food industry right now. We have benefits um, on, uh, for example, um, importers of um, feed importers, fertilizer importers, but also other players in the food industry. And for co of course, they would not like give away the, the benefits. Um, I'm looking for the word freiwillig. Um, yes, you understand, like without any pressure. And um, this is really, I think this is challenging to, to address with agroecological principles. So this is what, I would say are the four major challenges. And um, yes, if we look then at science, I think for me, it's very clear that um, science can do more transdisciplinary projects um, as we do it, for example, with this women project, but also the true cost accounting of food. We can, uh, science can, they, I mean, there are already a lot of scientific projects um, where you can see this, but I think there is, uh, there, we can do more. And um, for policy, it's for sure that um, it must be more cross, cross sectoral. The policies are important instruments and um, they have to address also these financial interests and these several interests of the big players of the food industry. And not only, I would say now, but in, in, in a bit, um, yeah, it's probably a bit um, simplified, but now we have like policies on the farmers and on the, they, they are not profiting like in a huge way. Of course, we pay a lot of money in the subsidies, but the industry which is inside or between the, the farmers and the consumers, um, it's it's um, it's clear that they are doing the 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 high pro the, or they have the higher financial profits than the consumers and the producers. So it's really a challenge, and I think only pol politics can address this topic. From the practice side. Um, it's sure that the transformation of the food system with at the end only is only possible with with farmers which are ready to go at the way to also change things and um so it's very important that science and policy works very close with practice and this is really key for the agroecological part also and um of course, then we have very different farmers or different farmers groups as well. So sometimes it's, it can also be interesting to do policies for these different groups and special policies and not the same policy probably for all the farmers or also to um, do in, if you look at, if you go back on the science perspective, we can do also the same project like with two different farmer groups to see um, how they react on, uh, in, their, in this project. 
I have for you um, one example, which I think it's really, um, uh, for me, it's a very good example how it can work. We have the Sprech Klimaneutrale Landwirtschaft in Kanton Graubünden. It's a project with a clear focus on goals and um, most important issues in case of reducing green gas emissions. But um, they, they put on the principle of participation, co-creation of knowledge. And we have visited this project and it was really, really impressive what is going on in these farmer groups who are doing together this co-creation of knowledge and the innovation. And what I took back from this was like, we cannot just doing projects and enhancing innovation when we don't have real the goals and we don't have uh, the direction um, of the of a successful food system transformation. So this is very important. I have to check the time. <laughs> um, I will skip probably that. Uh, you can. It, it's very good publication. But um, also, a professor from ETH was contribute uh, had his contribution, and it's really worth to to read it if you are interested in it. And I think I always say, already said the main conclusions. And I'm now really curious for your questions. And then I hope um, it was good for you to hear about all these things. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lara, indeed, for this uh, overview and, and for sharing also concrete examples on projects which triggered a lot of questions indeed already in the chat. <laughs> but I tried to make your life a bit easier and, and try to call connect and, and, and group a bit to some of these questions. And if there are others, you're always welcome to directly also direct them to, to Laura. Maybe um, we start with, there were two questions as far as I see on the your first topic. You started with the, the biodiversity issue. So there is a status report published in 2016 on the environmental objectives of agriculture. And it was stated there that Switzerland hasn't reached any of the biodiversity goals and that there is even loss of biodiversity. Um, the question was if you are aware of plans to integrate more agroecological principles on a broad scale to mitigate some of these losses or even increase biodiversity in agriculture. So if there are any plans, concrete plans. plans. In terms of implementing yeah. agroecology in, in policies yeah, it's written in this, this, in this postulate of the Federal Council. It's written in it that we should do this and that this is direction to go. But uh, we, we don't know yet if it's all also integrated in the agri agriculture policy of 2030. This is what we don't know yet. Uh, we, nobody knows. Only the federal, the federal office knows whether they will go. Uh, by the end of the November, we will know more. But I can, unfortunately, I cannot. Uh, answer these questions. I hope so. I think it's very important that we do that, but yeah. So then maybe a bit more on a, a meta level, the, the question also linked to biodiversity law. Um, um, what are the various dimensions you see where in which biodiversity connects to land and natural resource governance? So where is the connex between land a natural land and natural resource governance and biodiversity. Well, from my perspective, that this is um, a very important uh, point because every farmer in, in Switzerland, that he, um, he or she thinks that he knows his farm and he decides where, where on his farm he will do this and that and how they want to use their own land. And this, the mostly, I would say like 80% see it as their own. They are... Um, um, they know their own land and they can do it and they, they don't want to have somebody else saying them what they have to do on their own land and this is what if we don't address this point it's really difficult to get the farmers on the, on this level or the majority of the farmers that they they really will do things on their farm for biodiversity because we cannot just picking up three and a half percent of the farm. It's not. It's never going to change the, the management system. We have to, to. I think you had some uh, lessons about this nutrients topic and everything. So it's it's um 
biodiversity cannot be addressed with like a policy with this three and a half person. It's, ne it's never going to happen that with that we can really do something for biodiversity. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, you... Yeah, but it raises probably directly another question if we stick a bit on biodiversity. So um, when we talk about the biodiversity biodiversity strategy, what are the levels that are addressed? Is it more the genetic level, the species level, or landscape level when you refer also to that 3.5%? Yeah, I think it's the, it's, the, it's the landscape level. So that what I explained, and, and I think if you look uh, on, on what we should do, um, there should be a shift also in the production schemes. There should be a, a shift in what uh, crops are um, produced and in, in, in which way the crops are produced. And to go back with the nutritionist, of course, we have to have less animals. And and this is like, to, to address these topics, you cannot speak about small policies this is what is really the challenge. That's why we, we I, I, from my perspective, we will never, we cannot address the question of biodiversity without talking about consumption, without talking about um, diets, without talking about these major changes on the whole value chain, probably. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that the farmers can do it alone. This is what is probably the main message. The target for the entire food system with all its different elements. Mm -hmm. And we will come to that. There are some questions related to what is then the role of, of kind of the policy framework. But before we come there, um, I would like to address two questions or, or bring two questions forward linked to the role of female or women in agriculture. Um, so first of all, uh, the audience is very happy with your focus on, on, on women. And do you know how much um, agricultural land in Switzerland is currently owned by women in, in percent, more or less? Do you, do you... I don't know the number. I have the number, but I don't know it by my by heart. I can check it and send you. <laughs> now, I tried to Google while <laughs> yeah, we were but we talking, have it. But Yes, we have an, an uh, estimate. We have mm -hmm. an estimate because it's also about, this is also what is mentioned is access to land. This is what is... Uh, um, we have women, uh, especially in the French-speaking part, really working on this because they say the access on land. We have um, still the problem, which goes back on the on the family farming system, that um, the farms are giving more to the male um, person or uh, persons of the family and not the female, and there is a very complex issue. And um, yes, this is also part of the of the project. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have a link on that project on your website? On yes, yes, we have, I have all the links. You can find a lot of things here Excellent. at the end of the presentation. That will be a, a, a one first source. And then there was another question and, and maybe I, I also recommend there is a, a, um, a report published every 10 years by the Federal mm -hmm. Office of Agriculture. Um, this, that, the, the, the report is also uh, linked here. Oh, yes. I, I, I have one. to say something about this report because it was this report triggering this project. Gladly. I'm you really do that. not Thank happy you. from a scientific point of view about this report. I can say it like this. <laughs> and yeah. could you be a bit more explicit? Because the question was indeed okay, uh, how is inequality evaluated? Is there a survey conducted? And indeed, for that report of the Federal Office, the, the third one on your list here, there mm -hmm. was been a survey, but maybe... Um... I, can, I can put like a very simple example, because now we have the chance to reanalyze exactly this data. And by redoing the, the analysis of the data, we saw how they, they put the questions. And the questions, for example, were like, what is the most important role for you? Like the role as a mother or the role as an operation manager or the role as whatever. And this is like, and then most of the women um, said that the role as a mother is the most important role they see. But it's like a question you will never ask on any other survey about agriculture to the men. Of It's like oh, the way that the, the questions were were were. were um, 
Really? Develop this is already a, a problem. And also out of this, we don't have the good data because they didn't check whether women uh, are now operation managers because um, uh, they're only on the paper or if they really do the work. Or also if you have women doing or taking all the decisions and on the farms, but not being the operation manager. So the, the, the questions are not precise enough and there must be really better work on it um, from a scientific point of view that we have then a data which you really can do um, also. And what we see that they raised also problems, but then nobody feels <laughs> feels like um, addressed to then solve or to go further uh, into this. So if you read this report, you, you see what you see some of the problems, but then now there are no measures or any policies or something going out of it. So this is what we. This is where what triggered then. The, the, there was this international also um, uh, congress, uh, congress. Uh, last year, and uh, yeah, that the, this this project was uh, created then after this congress. Maybe we go one level even further, and there were quite some questions on on policies in general or or, or responsible governance. And there is also somehow in the questions a bit uh, the, the observation that things are not moving fast. So how could, what are, what is missing for a responsible governance? And how could these missing policies be installed faster? And there was also a link kind of governance and, and the role of, of consumers and you raise that as well as, as as the role of consumers also to play a part and be incentivized to to also kind of have more responsibility in, in let's say also in, in terms of fairness within food systems so if you could elaborate a bit on how can we do things better faster and more inclusive what are your ideas around this I'm sure that we um, um, we should do a food system policy and not anymore an agriculture policy. If you can, if we can achieve this, it would change a lot of things. Unfortunately, for the moment, it doesn't seem like that. It's still called agriculture policy for the 2030. So I'm not really sure that we're gonna achieve that. And um, of course, there is this agri agriculture 20. 22, it was a shock because they tried to do this approach to integrate everybody and at the end it was not accepted by um, the Swiss parliament. And if I knew the, 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 the recipe of this question, I would like uh, start immediately with the work. Um, I think, or what is what I try personally to do is really to, uh, we all, we, everybody knows which are the very powerful organizations who are then dominating also the political process and to really go into discussion with them and not to do this um, uh, controversial debate, but really try to go on what I, I see a huge, um, that's why we are also pushing the true cost accounting of food um, because for farmers, they are saying we have to, it's too, um, I'm looking for the words in English because I speak only German about this Swiss policy st uh, stuff. Um, the administrations um, lost, uh, so the administration. The burden of high administration. Yeah, lost. yeah, and this is like a, a problem. If if we if, if this is what I say, if the farm farms have to do everybody everything themselves, they have to solve every problem themselves without any help of the consumers. We are not going to do it. So I personally would try to convince um, the big farm organization that they will go on this on this train to really do the whole value chain if we can and. Yeah, a lot of scientific persons or like Bernard Lehmann also write this on his uh, the publication I was showing before. This is thinking the key point. We have to, we really have to get this. And we, we have the powers now. We had the elections uh, on Sunday. So the, we know um, how it's going to be the next four years. And we really have to go into discussions to find the, 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 the topics where we are close. And then everybody goes to... Um, I don't know, like the, 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 
it's basic common yeah, this, the monument, the denominator yes yes mm -hmm. This so would be small my steps, hope. but steps in the right direction. That yes, I hope. think. Yes, I think the. I don't know anything, but uh, uh, there was this um, uh, proportion of Lucas Fesenfeld with this um, uh, governance uh, topic. I found it very interesting, but it's never going to happen in Swiss politics system. I mean, it's very interesting, and I would love to do it, but you will because the the power is defined by the Swiss Parliament, and they can and. Only then they can decide whether they want that, and they will never accept it. So, this is what is the reality check to such good ideas, unfortunately. Thank you. And maybe I try to group a last group of questions. We talk also when we talk about agroecology. Of course, we talk a lot about farmers. Maybe not enough with farmers. That's that's uh, always an issue, but it's not so easy either. But um, on the other hand, uh, there are some questioning which, which address directly also farmers. So one question was, is there any way that farmers can directly take part in the policy making process? And then linked to that, maybe, um, could you share some examples of policies that support local farmers and small scale market networks, for example, in equipment knowledge, seed sharing or, or, or similar and linked to that maybe also a bit similar is the 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 question whether there are policy measures in place currently which promote input reduction in agriculture and are there any economic or financial incentives for farmers to adapt these input reduction techniques um i would say there are some but not enough <laughs> And um, if we look at the whole subsidy system, we we it's very contradictionary. We have like some policies which are really cool, like the um, oh, I'm really looking for the words the grassland um to to which it does incentives that uh, you will use less um, um feed uh, imported feed for example but then on the other hand um we have um subsidies which goes on a completely other direction so we have um we, we have a system um I, I would not say all of the policies we have the, the current policies for agriculture um are in switzerland there are some very good policies but in a whole we have too much um they, they don't go to the same goal so, um, for example, if you want to build a new, um, 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 I'm, uh, I have, I'm a bit um, out of my English, as you know, as you can see, as you can hear, <laughs> um, if you want to build a new um, building for your cows, <laughs> um, then uh, you get some money only if you have a certain, a certain direction of your farm. It's much more difficult to get a certain kind of subsidies in Switzerland if you are doing on an extensive way your farm. So this gives the, the we call this uh, conflicts of goals. Uh, we, it doesn't go all everything on the on the right direction. So we really need to have more consequent policy. So not all the policies are bad for like reducing. Um, or all the questions you ask or in um, helping um, in the good direction, but they don't go to the same direction. So we, we have, um, this is what, what is then difficult for the farmers also. I, if I speak, I speak a lot with young farmers, they feel um, disoriented by the incentives they have on, on, on the same, on their own farm. It's very difficult then to choose one direction and to stay on that and to feel also supported by the subsidy system in a consequent way. Thank you. Maybe concluding with, with a last question or, or, or an attempt to connect two questions on the true cost accounting you mentioned earlier. Um, one question goes a bit into the direction that sounds very interesting, but is it not far too slow as a concept in, in terms of uh, implementation when we think about dynamics in, in agricultural markets? 
And a bit linked to it is also the question related to, okay, we, we have true cost accounting, but we have a lot of variation too in the food system due to climate change, or we can never account for all uh, important uh, potential factors. So what is your, your kind of, how do you see the concept of true cost accounting uh, before the background of dynamic markets and changing environments and 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 that that we have to find a bridge between what is conceptually important to encompass and what is feasible then at the end. Yes, of course, it would be nice to go very fast, but this is probably also because we know know the reality of. Also, all, every measure that goes in direction of true cost, I think, or it can come also from the stakeholders or from the retailers. Um, they can try to do it, but I think only policies can at the end change this with incentive taxes or something. So we can decide today to do incentive taxes on um, import of fertilizers um, um, or import of feed. But, uh, or also um, doing taxes on meat consumption, for example, which was also already proposed. Um, this would be the fast way. I think this is the way I understood you. So to go fast, to do the, the right things. But I will not say we have majority right now to do this kind of things. And our project is trying to do the small steps in order to prepare then the big steps, because only if you have the majority understanding what we are talking about, you can go for the big lines. But of sure, it would be nice to go to do to do this in a dynamic way, to go fast. Um, or I don't know if I understand your question no, I guess precisely. You, no, no, I guess you 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 captured it very well, and it summarizes very nicely what you were telling us in the last hour is that it's important to take the right steps to accept also within the policy process that it's maybe not the first best solutions uh, derived from science, but there is a translation needed from what we identify in science as probably first best solutions and then the implementation in policies um, need to, to, to adapt to the realities. That's how I would summarize your, mm -hmm. your input and, and um, leading me to slowly closing this session by, by really thanking you for your um, input and your openness to the questions and for for helping us to understand that yes there is there is the as you called it white paper green uh, grass environment and there is real life which needs to to somehow find the right balance between increasing the speed of transformation, but having everyone on board in order to also implement solutions which are successful. So thank you very much, Laura, for being with us this, this evening. And thank you all for staying until 20 past six and um, and sharing these very interesting questions with us and helping us all to reflect and and think and get inspired and with that i'm already now very much looking forward to next week's um, intervention by emil frison and thank you all for being with us at this virtual table tonight thanks lara thank you very much